You know, a couple can start out their life together feeling just grateful and amazed that they have found love in one another. But over time, that gratitude and amazement can give way to familiarity and the familiarity to routine and the routine to boredom. And if that couple isn't careful, the boredom can give way to potentially dangerous discontent. It's sad to say that that doesn't just happen with couples. Our relationship with God can follow that same sort of trajectory. Uh, What might begin as a vital relationship with the Lord in which we uh, really understand the gift of God's grace and we're excited about it can give way over time to our taking it for granted and just going through the motions. And so God sent his prophet Malachi to his people in order to reignite uh, that once heartfelt relationship that they had had with the Lord that for them had become pretty routine. This week we are continuing our summer message series called The Texts That Have Touched Us. And in this series we have been exploring how God has used particular passages in Scripture to to challenge us and to inspire us and and to comfort us, not just to inform us, but even to transform us. As we've heard different members of our church family talk about the passages that really have come to have special meaning for them. This week we are looking at a passage from Malachi, Malachi chapter 1, chosen by one of our elders, Jason Leedy. Let's have a listen. Hi, my name is Jason Leedy, and the text that touched me is Malachi 1, 8 through 11. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So over the past few weeks, we have been looking at a number of texts uh, whose meaning has obvious and... uh, uh, immediate, it's obvious and immediately accessible to us. You know, trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Why did Jason choose a text about offering blind animals to the Lord? Let's take a look at that. Um, it comes from the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Because he is the last of the Old Testament prophets in uh, the Christian uh, Bible in our Old Testament, he is also the last book in the Old Testament. Uh, The book of Malachi comes from what's called the post-exilic Persian period. That's about 450 to 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, And just to give you a little bit of background here, in last week's message on Lamentations 3, uh, we learned how Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon had laid siege to Jerusalem in 586-587 B.C. Uh, he had surrounded it kind of to starve the people out and so on. Uh, after a, an 18-month siege, he finally succeeded in pulling down the city walls. Uh, he first looted and then uh, destroyed the temple of the Lord, set fire to the city, reduced it to ashes, Um, captured King Zedekiah as he was trying to make his escape. 
uh, held him down as he, uh, to force him to watch his, uh, his sons be executed, then gouged out his eyes so that would be his last living memory, and then carried King Zedekiah and most of the rest of the population of Israel away in chains to Babylon, 587 B.C. Now, the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied that that exile or that Babylonian captivity would last 70 years. So a remnant of the captives returned to Jerusalem. A small number of the captives returned to Jerusalem in 538 B.C. Under the ministry of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, they did their best to rebuild the temple. Uh, it, it, it did not match by any means its previous glory, but they did their best to rebuild the temple so that the priests could again um, offer sacrifices and so on. Some 60 years later, in 458 BC, Ezra the scribe helped to rebuild the nation by reintroducing the, the Torah which sparked a spiritual revival. All this time, more remnants are returning to to Jerusalem. And one of the reasons that the scribe Ezra felt it was necessary to reintroduce the the Torah is because it had been forgotten. It had been neglected. And so he stood and read uh, the Torah as the people of Jerusalem uh, stood and listened and wept. Fourteen years after that, in 444 B.C., person by the name of Nehemiah, who was the cupbearer, one of the the most trusted counselors to the king of Persia, uh, asked for and received permission to return to Jerusalem himself and to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. Up to that time, Jerusalem was an unprotected city. Nehemiah was able, uh, of course, to organize the people of Jerusalem they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. And this despite uh, the fact that they were facing fierce opposition from the Samaritans and the Ammonites and the Arabs and the Philistines who lived around Judah and didn't want a strong uh, Jerusalem. The Jews had been back from Babylon then about 100 years when God called the prophet Malachi to ministry. While their experience, the the people of Israel's experience in exile, had pretty much cured them of their idolatry, they were no longer worshiping foreign gods as they once had, their devotion to the Lord was, as we can see from today's text, uh, anything but stellar. Now, that's the kind of historical context. Um, how is the book of, of Malachi organized? The book of, of Malachi is organized around uh, uh, what are called a series of disputations. Uh, and these are disputations that follow very uh, strict patterns, repeated over and over again. The prophet is called by God to make a statement or a pronouncement. That is followed by a question from the people. That question is followed by a response and then a rebuke. So I'll give you an example of this at the very beginning. The book begins uh, with the word, a prophecy. That's a really interesting word. You might take it for granted. Uh, It's a fascinating word. The the Hebrew word behind that's translated prophecy is um, masa, and it means an utterance, or literally a burden, or a donkey's load. If you've ever seen a picture of a donkey, you know, carrying... Uh, stuff along a trail at the Grand Canyon or whatever. That would be the word that the Hebrews would use to describe that load. It's exactly the same word that Malachi uses here that's translated a prophecy. Now, do you think that's kind of strange that it would be the same word? Prophecy and a donkey's load? Why is that? Um, what, What Malachi is called to announce to the people of Israel is a burden. And in, unless you have uh, found yourself in a position that, that I do, where you're delivering messages to um, a community of faith on a, a regular basis, it's kind of hard to understand this. Um, but sometimes God will give his messengers a word that they don't want to share. 
they don't want to, to give um, because it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to the people who are listening to it, and it's no fun for the person who is called to deliver the message. Malachi felt that his message was a burden. It was a burden because, number one, it came from God. It's not what Malachi would have said if he had his choice. I get it. I empathize with him because I would love every single week, you know, stand up here and say, you know, be Mr. Rogers. I love you just the way you are, and it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and it's all good. I mean, right? And isn't that what you would love to hear? Not God's word. Um, I mean, it is true that you're beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But, but it's a burden because God is charging him uh, to share a message that uh, it, it would not be his choice to do. And it's a burden because, and here's why it's not his choice, it's a rebuke. It's like saying, you guys aren't doing this right. And it's a burden, and it's a huge burden, because what Malachi has to say to his people and how they respond to what Malachi is going to share with them from the Lord. How they respond really matters. Their spiritual well-being rests on how they respond. Their future of their nation depends on how they will respond. So, a prophecy, the word of the Lord, so this is God's word, to Israel through Malachi. What's he say? I have loved you, says the Lord. Very first thing. I've loved you. But you ask, how have you loved us? So you can see right here is the beginning of this pattern I was telling you about. A, a pronouncement from the Lord. I've loved you. And then a question. How? And this pattern, uh, one of the things I would really encourage you to do this week um, sometime is um, open up your Old Testament, turn to the, the very uh, last book in, in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and read it through. It's just four chapters long, and one of the things that you'll discover is that pattern shows up six times in Malachi. And why does Malachi use this pattern? I'll tell you why. Because the pattern serves to reveal the problem that the prophet was sent to address. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord. And how does, does Israel respond to this? It's kind of an uh, interesting question. Um, how do you respond to that? To know that God loves you. How do you respond to that? I... I mean, do you just go through life uh, with a sense of amazement and gratitude? Wow. God loves me. In the case of the people of Israel, you know what, how they respond? With skepticism. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? See what I was talking about earlier, how a couple can start out their life together feeling grateful and amazed for the love that they have found in one another. But over time, that gratitude and amazement uh, can give way to familiarity and familiarity to just routine, routine to boredom, and boredom to unseen danger. What had happened is the people of, of Israel, um, they were professing believers, but in a sense they were becoming practicing atheists. They'd lost their love for God. And because they'd lost their love for God, they began to question God's love for them. I'll tell you something, as you read through Malachi and just you know, as we think about our own lives, that mindset has profound implications. It had profound implications for how the people of Israel approached worship and how they thought about God. Um, I want you to, just for a moment to, to 
to think about how you would answer this question. Um, if, if somebody were to ask you, what is the point of worship? What's the point of it? Why do we do it? I've heard a lot of answers to that question. I, you know, I think uh, some people associate worship with just the music. Other people associate worship with just the, the message. You know, I come to hear the message. You know what the point of worship is according to Scripture? The point of worship is to glorify God. That's why we get together, to glorify God, to, to honor God's holy name. That means our singing is meant to glorify God. And so our worship team, they're not here to perform for us. They're here in order to lead us in glorifying God through our voices. One of the things that we, we might want to ask is, you know, do I glorify God? When I come here, do I come here to glorify God? Or do I sneak in late after the music is over so I don't have to sing? Is that glorifying God? The message is meant to glorify God. The message is meant to glorify God. And I think that is super important. I, I love this, this quote, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, our chief end, you know, the question is, and this is kind of an old school way of putting it, but that's the way it was originally uh, written. What is the chief end of man? Chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's what we're supposed to do in worship. It's, what we are, it's The message is meant to do that, to glorify God. Our response to the message is meant to glorify God. Our offerings are meant to to glorify God. And that's because what God wants from us is that our lives are aligned with God's plan. Our worship should be aligned with God's plan. And what is God's plan? Well, according to today's text, for those of you who are waiting to write down number one, God's plan, God's plan is to glorify his name among the nations. That's God's plan to glorify his name among the nations. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations. And it's not because God's an egotist or anything like that. It's because God wants to bless us and God wants not just to bless us, but God wants to bless all people everywhere, from the rising of the sun to its setting, all people, all places. Worship is all about bringing glory to the name of God. And just ask yourself, when I come to worship, is that my mindset? I'm here to bring glory to the name of God. In his book, uh, A Hunger for God, uh, John Piper, who's just written so much great stuff, uh, points out Quote, God elects his people before the foundation of the world for his glory. It's in Ephesians 1. I, Isaiah 43 says he creates humankind. He created us for his glory. He chose Israel as a holy people set apart for his glory. He delivered them from Egypt for his glory. He restored them after the exile, after the Babylonian captivity, the period of time that we're looking at right now, according to Isaiah, he restores them after the exile for his glory. He sends his son Jesus to confirm the tr his trustworthiness so that the Gentiles will glorify him. Not just the people of Israel, but the Gentiles as well. His son Jesus dies on the cross in our place to display the glory of his vindicated righteousness. He commands his people to do all things. 1 Corinthians 10, he commands his people to do all things. Why? For his glory. He'll send his son a second time for his glory. And in the end, the Bible tells us, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's all about glorifying God 
for his goodness and his mercy and his love. That's why, why this passage starts out, the book of Malachi starts out with God saying, I've loved you. See, in all of this, we glorify God for who he is. We glorify God for who he is. You know, a lot of times, uh, we, you know, I think when we're younger in our faith and we don't understand this completely, uh, we glorify and thank God for what he does for us. That's one of the interesting questions to ask ourselves. You know, do, do I come to worship because of what I get out of it? I hope you get something out of it, to be sure. You know, God is gracious and, and always giving. I hope there's always something in the message and in the, the, the singing, in, in the giving, in response to God's grace that uh, sustains you. But we don't just glorify God for what he gives us because if for some reason we're not experiencing what he gives us, does that mean we don't glorify God anymore? No, we glorify God for who he is. This is why Malachi uses a really special title, probably more than, than anybody else in, in the Old Testament. When, when he speaks about God, he calls him the Lord God Almighty or the Lord God of hosts. He uses that title 24 times in just 55 verses, 24 times, almost half of the, of the, uh, the verses. That, that word host, when it says the Lord God of hosts, what that refers to is a, a huge number, a huge number of armies or of angels or of stars. The point being that the Lord God Almighty has infinite authority and infinite power over the entire universe. You know, Malachi really wants to impress upon us who God is so we can glorify his name. Malachi wants us to know that, that God is awesome beyond our understanding. And that's why, and this super important point, how we worship the attitude that we bring to worship, uh, what we bring to worship, how we worship either glorifies or dishonors God's holy name. That's point two, by the way. You know, thoughtless, thoughtless, careless worship simply comes from a failure to recognize and to respond to the greatness of God. And this is why... Um, the Lord Almighty uh, speaks through Malachi and, and asks, you know, where's the honor due to me? Where is the respect that's due me, says the Lord Almighty? And this is why uh, in this passage, the, the Lord actually charges the priests, because they're responsible for what takes place in the worship life in the temple. The Lord Almighty charges the priests with showing contempt. Contempt. Think about it. contempt for his name. Uh, you might be wondering, you know, how, how'd they do that? They were wondering that too. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? There's a disputation again. And the Lord answers by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? And here we come to Jason's text. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, isn't that wrong? That word could also be translated evil wrong. It's evil. When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, isn't that wrong? Isn't that evil? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Now, why was it wrong and why it was evil? Because uh, there were really strict protocols that the priests were obliged to follow that were written into the Torah itself. This is God's word. You know, Le Leviticus and, and in Deuteronomy. 
And what was hap- and you were not to offer lame or diseased or blemish animals to God. And the reason the priests were showing contempt is that they were actually permitting the people of God to bring unacceptable and unworthy offerings to the Lord in knowing, willful violation of God's word. See, they weren't really offering sacrifices to the Lord. You know why? Because a sacrifice is a sacrifice. A sacrifice costs you something. They weren't offering sacrifices. They were cleaning out the attic. They were not honoring God. They were simply giving God what they didn't want. What they didn't need. And this is why Malachi 1 came to be the text that touched Jason Leedy. Let's take a listen. I really love this verse. Um, first, because it comes from a book like Malachi. I think that as believers, we can become conditioned to live in only a subsection of the Bible. And um, the rest of the books were put in there for filler. I think they have a really great insight into the character of God and, and into who we are as, as broken people. And, and this is definitely one of those examples um, for me. Um, it came to me during a really difficult period in my life. I, I was recently engaged and I just had lost my job. I was couch surfing. I wasn't very sure how I was going to um, uh, provide a place to live and what that was going to look like after, after, after our marriage. And uh, I was feeling a lot like the Israelites were feeling in, in Malachi that um, you know, I was owed something from God um, because I thought I was making choices in my life that were honoring to Him. When I came across this verse and I started reflecting on it, um, it really convicted me in my heart that, that the way that I had been serving God had become um, casual, it had become uh, routine, and I wasn't really giving uh, my best. I wasn't giving in a way that was much of a sacrifice at all. I was really giving um, out of convenience, um, giving what was uh, easy, and, and and that was both with with money, but also the time. You know, I was serving when it was sort of convenient for me, um, picking and choosing, and not fostering much of a you know commitment to any one thing. And um, I was reading through. This, this verse in Malachi, and it's these, these Israelites who, who, are, who are expecting things, and they're themselves getting convicted that he deserves those first fruits. You know, I, I was having a difficult time, like I said, um, just kind of getting by on, on unemployment and trying to figure things out. Um, but I sort of drew a line in the sand for me, even during that very bare um, time, and said, you, you know, if, if I'm going to start honoring God with um, the, the way that I give, both with time and money, um, I'm going to do it now when I don't have very much. Um, the time to start giving is not when you have an abundance. The time to start giving is right now. Uh, and I did that. And, uh, you know, later on in Malachi, it talks about, um, you know, testing God in this and see if you don't, if, if you bring the full tithe so that there's food in my house, um, wait and see if I won't open up the heavens and, 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 bless you till there's no room for no more, right? Um, and so I really took that to heart. And I said, you know, okay, uh, I think a, a lot of us are very comfortable. We can go right to the, you shall not test the Lord your God, but there is this one exception. And it happens to, happens to occur in this very small book at the very end of the Old Testament about giving, um, where God says, you know what, put me to the test in this and see if I, see if I don't hold up my end of the bargain. And um, I would say that's certainly been my experience. Um, glory to God in that. Um, but it all started sort of being being convicted by this by this little verse in Malachi. Good, huh? So th- there's so much in in uh, what Jason said that w- that we could talk about. One of the 
the observations I made as I uh, was, uh, actually while we were taping this, it, it occurred to me that um, both Jason and uh, Leanna Bivens, whom we heard from a couple of, of weeks ago, um, who shared the, the passage from uh, the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are, are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. Uh, both of them talked about kind of feeling like God owed them something. You know, they were living a, a certain way. They started making these new choices and stuff, and they felt like God owed them. And uh, you ever feel that way? Uh, the question is this, though. Does God owe us anything? And where is that in the Bible? That part about God owes us. It does say he loves us. And he wants to bless us. And he does say, you know, live in, in a certain way. But it doesn't really say that God owes us. It does say, though, that we owe God everything. See, God's, God's plan is to glorify his name among the nations among the Gentiles, among all people everywhere, from the rising of the sun uh, to its setting. And how we worship and, and how we give either glorifies God or dishonors God. Uh, people of, of Israel, during this post-exilic Persian period, were showing God disrespect and they were dishonoring God. And they were displeasing the Lord, God of hosts. The one who had created them. The one who loved them. The one who had called them to be a holy people set apart. The one who had a plan for them. And they were, were showing disrespect and dishonoring and displeasing God by bringing God offerings that they wouldn't think of giving to their governor. Sacrifices that weren't any kind of sacrifice at all. Sacrifices that were, in, in fact, clearly, explicitly, repeatedly forbidden in Scripture. And I kind of, I kind of can uh, imagine their thought process. You know, they're going, you know, it's just going to go up in smoke anyway. Who's going to care? Well, I'll tell you, God cares. <laughs> they're supposed to be a holy people set apart. And they're supposed to behave in a, a different way out of gratitude and thanksgiving so that God's name could be glorified among the nations. The point of all of this is, is that honoring God, honoring God rightly means bringing God our very best. Not cleaning out the attic or giving God our leftovers. And listen, not because God needs our gifts. We want to give God our best because we need God. We need God. And we are grateful for His mercy and for His grace and for His love and for His choosing us to represent Him. And that's why, by the way, as Jason points out, Malachi goes on, this would be in the third chapter of Malachi, to talk about tithing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, the word tithe means one-tenth. God, through Malachi, was instructing his people to give the full tithe. That's the first tenth, not what's left over at the end, but the first tenth. It's to be brought to our place of worship. That's why it says bring the full tithe to the storehouse. What's the storehouse? It's a part of the temple where the gifts that were given by God's people, the tithes, were stored. And why were they stored there? So that they could be used by the Levites, a, a tribe 
that, um, that God had set apart for service in the temple, to maintain the temple, to make sure that the sacrifices took place appropriately and so on. Bring the full tithe to the storehouse. It's really important we, we understand this because um, I think a lot of people, I think it's, it's partly because as uh, people who live in the United States of America, we enjoy special uh, benefits that other places don't. We confuse tithing with charitable giving. And we do it all the time. Because, you know, when you fill out your tax forms and stuff, there's, you know, you can list your charitable giving and stuff. Now, here's the thing. The, The concept of charitable giving, that is a governmental policy. And you could designate where your charitable giving goes. But God, in Malachi chapter 3, stipulates that our tithes go to the place of worship. It's to the storehouse. And then God says, and this is, uh, this is awesome, and, and I've heard, uh, you know, we heard Jason talk about it. I've heard so many other people talk about this, and it's been my, uh, my experience as well. God says, do, he actually s- says, test me in this. Test me in this. It's the only place in the Bible, you know, wh- where he says that. You know, Jesus elsewhere says, you don't put the Lord your God to the test. But here God's actually inviting us to do it. See if I won't bless you. Now, God is so concerned that we bring glory to his name uh, through right worship that he actually instructs Malachi to tell his people, look, I would just as soon somebody lock the temple doors to keep you from lighting useless fires on my altar. I'd much sooner you just lock the temple doors than to bring offerings that dishonor me. And this is where we read these haunting words and how painful. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Can you see why Malachi felt like delivering this message would be a burden? But it does raise, raise a question for us. Does our worship, you know, everything that we do here, does our worship bring honor and glory to God? When we sing, do we bring honor and glory to God? With the attitudes we, we bring, do we bring honor and glory to God? By our choice to, to invite or kind of pass over that part of scripture uh, people who don't know God does that bring honor to God's name do our offerings magnify the name of God I think one of the most powerful questions to ask ourselves is is the question gosh if everyone worshipped like I did if everybody gave like I did if everybody served like I did would the church be better Or would it be worse? It's a haunting question. Do our attitudes and actions offer a worthy witness to the love and grace of God who sent his son to die on a cross for us? You know, the first time you hear that, maybe not the first time you hear it, but the first time you get it, that Jesus died on the cross for me, it just fills you with such awe and gratitude You can't imagine ever taking that for granted. But over time, gratitude and awe gives way to familiarity. And familiarity to routine. And over time, other things just seem more important. And maybe we find ourselves going down that same road that the people of Israel did. Are we giving God our, our very best? And not to win his approval, because I mean, if God already loves us with a perfect love, what can you add to that? We give God our very best not to win his approval, but to recognize his majesty. He's the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, maker of all things visible and invisible, commander of armies and of angels and of stars. We give our very best to recognize who he 
is. Not what he gives us, just who he is. And to thank him for the unearned, unmerited, undeserved gift of his mercy and grace, forgiveness and love. Are we glorifying God's name among the, not just among the nations, just among the people we know by acting in a way that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ? You know, for some people, you are the only Bible they will ever know. The reason we're called Christians, it means little Christ, and God puts us into the world and scatters us all over the place So, with the intention of people seeing Christ in us. Are they doing that? And again, do we understand what it means that the Lord God Almighty, commander of armies, angels, and of stars, doesn't owe us? Doesn't owe us but still perfectly loves us. Yet knowing that, how could we not want to glorify his holy name? 